So, talking about intruding, this is a project by uh, two uh, linguists and computer scientists, and uh, one of them also a uh, conventional classicist, who uh, uh, intruded without permission in the field of oral writings in order to ask general questions about the language cognition and the creation of traditional discourse uh, by looking and some of the findings of, of, of people in oral poetics clearly trying to exploit their work uh, in order to uh, uh, and use it for our own uh, purposes and, and benefits without any shame whatsoever. So we, this is a project that we began thanks to a fellowship uh, from the Freiburg Institute for Advanced Studies and uh, I really wanted uh, to do linguistic research uh, using uh, the findings from uh, cognitive linguistics and discursive analysis and combining them with what they have in common with Parry and Lord. Uh, mainly the, the connection we're talking about today is the connection between composition and performance, what this phenomenon that we have seen, and uh, the, the, the idea of the usage-based linguistics, which is uh, gaining uh, momentum in the field right now, that is to say, uh, focusing on usage in order to understand how language works. Uh, we're talking about phenomena of language acquisition that are usage-based, in the case of, of this field world, composition and performance, uh, and when this tradition emerges, it emerges through the creation of four meaning function pairs, these kind of formulae. Uh, and we think that the way formulae have been studied and, and, and presented in, in the literature has many connections with the further development in the cognitive linguistics of the idea of a grammatical construction, of construction grammar, which is right now a very new field, which uh, is based on the same idea that, that language is not learned through transformation of rules because we now all hate Chomsky, but uh, instead is learned through uh, generalizations over individual instances of usage. So I know this, this chunk, I learned this other different chunk, I'm not very sure of the meaning until I integrate it into the tradition, just like my one year old child is, is doing right now. Uh, repeating words that you wouldn't dare to imagine that a one-year child would repeat, but <laughs> fortunately she's not very sure what it means yet. I wonder what will happen when she finds out. Uh, at the same time, these constructions uh, uh, in cognitive linguistics need to be understood uh, uh, within uh, conceptual frames. So you have a stock of uh, possible uh, uh, sentences and then you can be extremely creative that you learn that are appropriate to certain uh, cognitive settings such as the restaurant or the uh, the boring conference or the funny event etc or or the taxi or there are certain things that are uh, there are certain constructions that come in handy when you're talking to a taxi driver and uh, that you wouldn't use with your wife or vice versa in, in, in other settings. So constructions are not just hanging there, they are associated to conceptual frameworks. And we think that uh, we can see an analogy with this in the epic because uh, the formulas are not just end in themselves, ends in themselves, they are not just floating there, they are always associated to uh, certain things. So the result is the uh, emergence of meaning uh, by connecting and uh, integrating both entrenched structures that, that we have materialized in, in a dynamic way and my creativity in this moment. I, I, 
adapting to the, to the particular situation. And this might include something that is very interesting in cognitive science, which is a multimodal mental simulation. That is to say, I'm telling a story, I'm structuring a narrative, and I have some, uh, let's say, images or little things going through my mind, and I, uh, I organize them uh, into chunks of narrative uh, that are themes that have their associated language more or less relevant. And what we think is that uh, composition and performance is a great lab for this, because it's just like language, only much more so, much more idiomatic, much more conventional, much more demanding in the situation of performance. So idiomaticity is enhanced, and there are many things that we can learn about language and cognition by looking at this in, in an extreme situation, just like uh, people in physics uh, study uh, extreme conditions in which life flourishes, for instance. Uh, so this happened thanks to uh, one of the most uh, wonderful bright young linguists in Europe, Mihalo Antonich from the University of Nish, who cannot be here because he's flying to the conference. So let me read just uh, uh, a passage of, of uh, by Albert Dorf so that uh, you realize uh, that the people in this course analysis who are hearing about this for the first or almost the first time, that you realize what the feeling is when you read the kind of ideas that these people had well before cognitive linguistics or discourse analysis as we understand it now had been developed. Because you have to uh, remember that Lord's book is based on his doctoral dissertation from 1948. This is the way he talks about formula and theme. Each theme, small or large, one might even say each formula has around it an aura of meaning which has been put there by all the contexts in which it has occurred in the past. To any given point, at any given time, this meaning involves all the occasions in which he has used the theme or formula, especially those contexts in which he uses it more frequently. It involves also all the occasions in which he has heard it used by others, particularly by those singers whom he first heard in his youth, or by great singers later by whom he was impressed. To the audience, the meaning of the theme involves its own experience of it as well. The communication of this super meaning is possible because of the community of experience of poet and audience. So this is Lord of Discourse Analysis or the Company of Linguists. As you can say, as you can see, this is a usage-based linguistics. In fact, at when, when I am with Company of Linguists, I do this trick of exchanging and replacing the theme with formula, and the theme with, with frame, and formula with construction, and they're all delighted. They start asking whether Adele Goldberg or Bob K has written this text. So this is an example of the kind of statistical analysis that we were talking about before. This is the beginning of the year, maybe maybe, I don't know what it is, saying about the, the, the rage of Achilles, goddess. Uh, the, the lines underlying the chunks of the passage indicate uh, formulate chunks uh, that are repeated verbatim somewhere else in the poem, that is a straight line, or a dotted line that are repeated with just replacing one of the words uh, by, for instance, one of the adjectives, uh, replaced in, replacing them with a metrically equivalent one used for a different purpose. This is the this is uh, a piece of one of the Boston songs recorded by, by Lord. Uh, so what we see is that practically 100% of the poem is formulated. Uh, this doesn't mean it's not creative, it's formulate creativity. You, you, you uh, improvise a performance using these ready-made uh, blocks. And this is this comes very close to the idea of language that people use cognitive grammar has. So uh, the thing that we can do for the people, the thing that we believe we can do for the people in oral poetics, uh, since they have done so much for us, is uh, try to introduce construction grammar in the analysis, uh, uh, which means introducing meaning. Because the tradition, the parallel tradition, started with Parry and Lord, there is always complex sociology in, in scientific research. So they, they were fighting a war for everybody to recognize that this was really oral, that they were 
metrical constraints forcing these people to produce these lines as, as they were. Which means that Parry and Lord, especially Parry, because Lord lived much longer and had time to develop a little further his arguments, they strongly preferred uh, metrical arguments to any other explanation of why things were happening in, in that way. Because they really wanted to show uh, the scholarly community that this is a, an oral uh, composition performance, and they're adjusting to the metrics, and they're filling in metric slots, and they're doing it uh, in performance. Uh, this is one of Lord's uh, favorite horse, uh, favorite uh, uh, formula analysis. The horse mountain pattern. Right? He's talking about an abstract pattern that defines many different types of formulas. When I do this with Mihailo, I am uh, extremely, I have peace of mind because I have a native speaker who can read this. Uh, of course, it would be impossible to find a Serbo Croatian native speaker in this conference, right? Do, do I have a volunteer to read the left part, please? I can tell you that you know, not, not a single 10 year old or 20 year old Serbian or Croatian or Bosnian uh, citizen uh, can, can understand these words anymore. <laughs> it's too archaic. It's a really big dialect, just yes. like in Poland. Yes. So, uh, but you saw that she read them splendidly, you found the rhythm, <laughs> you saw that there are rhythmical and, and metrical variations. Now, it, the way uh, Lord explains the variation, because they're all saying the same, that he mounted his horse, right? There, there's variability as you have linguistic variation uh, across dialects and different singers. These are all from different singers and different uh, performances. So, the explanation by Lord is that uh, there is an abstract pattern that belongs to the common stock of all singers uh, that they possess and that allows them to produce the appropriate, uh, metrically appropriate sentences. Uh, because they cannot know by heart, remember that their argument is this is not learning by heart from the text. They cannot know by heart all these variations and when to say what. And the schema would be that when the verb moves to the first half line, uh, then the verb moves, sorry, to the first half line if an, an adverb and then if an adverbial complement is added to the verb or to the word horse, right? So this is a form of metrical analysis, right? We, we don't go into details, but that's the idea. These are cool uh, in mathematical lines. Right. So us, Antovic and and Canvas, uh, the cockpit linguists, what can we add here? Uh, to, uh, if we're trying to understand this as a, what construction grammarians call construction, uh, as, as a full meaning uh, pattern. So first of all, the verb means, means seat, right? Um, uh, or so Mihaila tells me. Uh, but here it means mount because of all the prefixes that are coming with the verb. Uh, both Za and O, right, uh, used to verb prefixes typically denote the beginning of an action. Right? This meaning coheres with uh, that of the article and that of the whole uh, verb that we're talking about. So uh, we're not only talking about someone mounting a horse, uh, we're talking about a transition in the narrative. The choice of pa is pa, in some of the examples. See, this bar, which is some kind of conjunction, let's put it that way, with a disyllabic verb, right? So some of the verbs are three syllables, you don't have pa, it doesn't fit into the verb. But when there are two syllables, you choose pa. So what, you put pa there. So a, a very, very uh, uh, mm, strong line of parallel tradition would say, and it is only the metrics that justifies that, because they're oral composers. What they care is about producing good lines. Of course, of course the metrics are good, they're, they're very important, and they're one of the constraints. But uh, the choice of bound 
it suggests that, that the hero had been doing something else. And then he moves on to the next action. It is all these uh, parts of meaning are all coherent about the fact that we're not only just saying that somebody jumps into a horse, but I'm calling your attention and telling you, hey, please. Now, this guy who is doing something else is going to do something different. And this is going to be meaningful because it's going to take us somewhere else in there. Now, if, we're, if I am singing in the way the singer sings, which is a little bit what I as you heard in the, the beginning, right? And I need to catch your, your attention. Uh, uh, I, I, I need to be giving you pragmatic cues uh, about and negotiating the meaning with you all the time so that you and I uh, are are sure that we're on the same page. So this is what we're arguing for. That uh, the structure itself has a schematic meaning, just like you know in construction grammar, you say the sooner the better, and it's not just the meaning of sooner and better. The R plus the R the R uh, has a meaning in itself. So we think that these are constructions we have because they have a meaning in themselves. And this is a, a, a formulation of the meaning. And we could use some others. But the fact is, is that the combination of forms is trying to, to uh, tell us that it would be uh, a perfected momentary action which has just started immediately after the previous action finished. Uh, to which the speaker has an emotional attitude that is, the speaker cares about. So we're saying that, and we are also saying that it's mounting the horse, and we're also being measurably uh, valid. It's uh, all these things uh, at the same time, and uh, they don't need to exclude one another. So examples like this uh, uh, take us to the, the conclusions, and then I have uh, further data about the project, but. Uh, I'm only going to show them to you in case you want to discuss something further because I want to need time for all the discussion and questions. Well, our theoretical proposal is that uh, an instance based theory of linguistic generalizations can model both formula and themes in our composition of formulas, while a non usage based theory of language cannot even explain the existence of it or composition of formulas as we know it. This means, uh, in, in very general terms, that uh, it's not easy if you're uh, a very hardcore uh, generativist, not that you really care about this, but it's not easy to explain oral epic poetry, the existence of oral from the next time at all, because you're not supposed to learn language that way. You're supposed to have your linguistic module, your uh, imperative syntax, and, and your learning language is supposed to be combinational in, in these hardcore theories. While uh, the fact that when these guys are free, so just to, uh, to put it this way, many linguistic theories would predict that oral singers uh, would produce uh, linguistic utterances or linguistic texts that are extremely different from uh, the other, their own performances some other day and the performances from all the others, and uh, that most of those sentences are new, are novel, uh, the vast majority of them, while what we find is over 99% formulaic utterances. And of course this must mean something. Uh, we also Propose that extremely demanding conditions and the creative use of, of patterns enhance the linguistic features that that people in, in these linguistic areas are invested in, dramaticity and, and formal periods, and expose the patterns themselves but even better than in everyday language. And it, this is also quite handy because, of course, it's very hard to study the constructicum of a language, the, the number of constructions that are apparent in. English that's immense. While this is a more reduced setting, a more, more reduced corpus uh, that can help you find some phenomena that are more easy to see otherwise. And that poetic and linguistic universal based on meanings and discursive functions may be operative if, uh, and, that, and that we can find out more about them if we can learn different oral traditions. Uh, in order to uh, uh, develop this, we have done some empirical studies and more time for that, we did one interesting thing. 
about temporal elliptics, and we studied a very nice ballet song of Baghdad. We were doing a circulation purpose. We were comparing uh, six versions by, say, by three different singers, uh, 16 years apart. One version was dictated, the rest were sung. We were, uh, these were speech introductions, like, and then he said, he said to me, right, and we were studying whether the role of this then, and then he said, was simply, or is and, were simply to fill in the metrical slots, or whether uh, they were also adding meaning. And what we seem to have found out, we'll see what reviewers say, is uh, that uh, there were many more of these expressions than one would expect, and with this course marker and, and a day take introducing speech more than it is normal in everyday speech, uh, uh, and that uh, apart from the frequency of usage, uh, the and the differences in which the singers would use them, I'm here summarizing very quickly, uh, what we saw is that there was an extreme coherence, so this one of the of the singers was singing 16 years apart, and even though he changed some building blocks of his themes, the thematic skeleton remained, and the statistical and more or less relative distribution of the deities and the and the time of burials in his speech introductions was more or less the same 16 years afterwards. And um, what we uh, was concluding is that they were adding some relevant information for the audience, not just saying, here, somebody is going to say something. Uh, when there is no particle and temporal deictic, uh, there seems to be less of a turn in the duration for the speech to the audience. Uh, and we saw, we, we had uh, here three samples, and uh, when there was a particle plus an adverbial, there was a term, a contrast in the duration. When there was just an adverbial, a smaller contrast was following, and with no adverbial, we couldn't find in the corpus any example uh, uh, where a significant contrast uh, was following. So somebody was saying something that had the power to change the course of the, of the duration. Uh, and we had a, a look at this at the beginning of the Iliad in Homer, and, and we seem to uh, have found some data that could mean that, that the deity particles there also, not the temporal variables of deity particles, they are also performing a, a similar function, but as I say, this is a very quick summary, and the data are only uh, preliminary. So, but, you know, Greek always impresses audiences, so that's why I like to use this slide in Greek. So, uh, what we concluded from uh, this empirical study is uh, that there is a prototypical way in which singers might introduce direct speech. They need their tendency is to use particles in a reflected time of variables in the case of the voice activation. Uh, it, and this is motivated by substantive more than, so by meaning rather than just metrics. The metrics uh, always need to be followed and preserved, but then you have also meaning. Uh, conditions because oral singers can be creative and it doesn't mean uh, that they're resorting to writing in their composition uh, and, that, and that these are used when somebody uh, has one more resource to tell the audience, hey, this guy is going to tell you to say something important and you really want to stop the chatting with the one sitting behind you, next to you and listen to this. And then she said, right, and, and there's, it would be very interesting to study uh, prosody and not just the distribution of suppressing negative particles. So, the general theoretical uh, uh, conclusions that construction grammar and all for the theory uh, are both arguing that language is articulated through the parents of form and function with the main phrase of tradition of nature. Remember that all the parallel argument is based on the fact that all the comparison Servo creation material with Homer is based on the fact that these are all human beings uh, creating these forces in similar conditions, and there must be something that we can call the human nature, there must be something that we can call the universals of the human mind that these guys are both using at the same time. Uh, and in, that 
in, the, in this case, it's always in the, 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 the stock phrases. Uh, the grammar of the song, just like the grammar of any language according to construction, grammar does not include transformation, derivation, and, semant uh, and semantics is associated directly with surface form, with, your, with, with what you're just saying. And finally, uh, what we know, the, the knowledge that, me, that it means, the, the corpus of knowledge that allows us to speak a language or to be able to compose for poetry performance includes both items that I know by heart and generalizations over instances that are systematic. And they are all acquired through the research based process. So the enhanced dramaticity of composition and performance provides this living laboratory that, that we have talked about. And therefore, we, we sincerely think that people in linguistics, discursive analysis, and post literary studies should be more interested in what is going on here because, as fascinating as written texts are, and as, fascinating, as dramatic as the changes brought by writing may be, this is the real stuff. This is the way language begins. This is the way public discourse begins. And uh, what we think is that when we're constructing a public discourse in a traditional setting, meaning is always central. And it is never only about empty slots uh, provided by a metrometrician. We have both ways. Uh, and that they're constrained by the metrics and the demands of performance. And inside into the mind of the singer and knowledge of what is going on in composition and performance can really help us uh, gain insight into the origins of language, culture, discourse, convention in the written language, and, and the interplay of convention and relativity. So this might be the beginning of a beautiful friendship, we hope so, and we hope that you enjoy this panel, and thank you very much, uh, special thanks again to the people who gave us the money to do the studies, and uh, please let me know if you have any questions for me or for any other of the members of the panel. Thank you very much. <laughs> to hungry for knowledge, very hungry. Uh, yeah. You were very convincing, so I believe you. Thank you. I but might go into politics after this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should. Uh, uh, so, after your talk, it seems obvious that it's a good idea applying constructive grammar to the modern poetry. You learn a lot. What do you think we can? So I'm not very into oral poetry, but I'm very really into construction grammar. So I'm interested in this part. What can we learn about construction grammar? What we don't already know in doing this kind of research. Okay. So I, I'm not quite sure if we need it. Maybe it, we can learn something about pragmatic entries. You know, in the meaning side of. And maybe we learn something about prosody, the role of prosody, and yeah, well, there, the there are many other things, there are many things that we haven't talked about, but uh, the immediate arguments are that uh, construction grammar is, I think, I'm not a, a, a great expert, but I think that construction grammar is gradually starting to pay more attention to discursive factors and uh, which as we all know are extremely important and also extremely infinite right and so this provides a, a universal uh, widespread setting uh, because there are hundreds of traditions we just talked about two there are hundreds of traditions so if we really have uh, if, we, if we collaborate with the people in other languages they can really tell us about how formulaic language is being used under very, very restricted circumstances of performance that are especially demanding in concrete terms, which is something that I think of the ground uh, should be interested in. And that's uh, one part of the argument. The, uh, the other part of the argument, there are more than two, is 
diacritic. We don't really have lots and lots of good studies in construction grammar about, uh, you know, with better respect. Now, in normal epic, the good thing is that uh, you already have a diacritic perspective by looking at a single piece of world epic, because everything that is there has been published. Every little formula that is there has been published by centuries and centuries of people. So, again, this can give you a corpus that you can handle, especially if there are brilliant people like this with developing technologies and corporate electronic corporate. Uh, the, in fact, the collection at Harvard has a lot to learn from, from uh, what they have done. This can really help you, uh, again, compare different instances for uh, have a diagrammatic perspective for construction of usage, right, in, in, in the same direction, etc. And then comes the multimodal part, the, the prosody, the mental simulation. And so I'm very happy with these questions because I have heard these lines. Uh, so uh, we have people in classics who have studied uh, in Homer uh, that these dative elements are used uh, as a way of uh, integrated for a way for integrating viewpoints, for pointing at the past from, from the future, from the ground, in the cycle of conversation, uh, to help the audience reenact the story, summoning the past into the here and now, and then with the viewpoints. Uh, there are people who are musicians, uh, too, like Anna von Katz and David Elmer, uh, two of my heroes, who uh, have wonderful studies about presentation particles and AP particles and server creations. And server creation really very good at showing that there is a zoom in effect when certain particles are used, for instance. And, uh, as for the king, he, right, this construction, as for the king, he, and then it's always asking you to zoom in or certain combinations of tenses. And uh, very recent uh, multimodal construction grammar by, by People like working on viewpoint learning, like Barbara is here, or uh, Kiki Miki for Ego, uh, working on in conceptual integration in the use of the now plus plus, plus, plus past construction. And uh, uh, have been used by Mark Turner and Frassen's team to, to propose that there is a multimodal uh, effect in the mind when things like, and now she said, right, there's a zooming effect. And, and they use the extremely cool, sorry, I'm not being modest, uh, television news library that I was presenting yesterday to find cases of now plus past and to show that very often they come accompanied by a zooming effect on, on television. And now she realized that they have zooming on, on, on the character's face. So these things, I think, are starting. And they're fascinating. There are lots of things, lots of things we can do, especially if we, compare, we are not afraid of comparing them. Uh, epic with technologies like television. Sorry, it was a long response, but it was. Oh, I'm glad. I couldn't yeah. miss the, the opportunity. I didn't pay him any money to ask this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should. I should take that. I find the question. I think it's a very good response. Uh, I also think that some linguistics that 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 start start. Then we come to this 
these layers of division which are transmitted for years and years and years ago. That you 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 cited uh, five uh, five uh, examples of this uh, uh, horse riding, whatever. Uh, try to morphine, yes. Uh, try to say I read a book or I sang a song in five ways. It is not possible. And if he wants to say that thing, he has to use these words, these verbs, this order, in these metrical uh, conditions. So it is not the formula. It's a, it's it's formula in a linguistic way, and you you you, you show that greatly. Yeah. Uh, but it is not the formula in this flat uh, sense. We also need to 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 know that lang a language is a tradition. So it, you, either you say things that are acceptable in the tradition, or if you're writing. That's okay. You can get away with it. You can be uh, an avant-garde poet, right? But but if you're in every in oral communication, you're going to lose your audience. Right? So it, yes, it but you always think about the same heroes, the same yeah, uh, actions. Exactly. You think about something that all in the audience know what will be. You and they not, have expectations. You do not invent. They know what will happen. You do not think it's as today. They 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 do not expect to be surprised. Right? Exactly. They have expectations about so what you're going to say. It's not for your life. It, it has to be that way. There is no other way to say about it. Just to yeah. It's, it's rather than subject, object, rather than cases. than contra parallel mode, because I don't think it's necessary to have Harvard and the whole American Navy uh, on our back upon this. But it's it's more. I would give them the benefit of the doubt in the sense that. Uh, they were pioneers, they were fighting, if you put things in context, they were fighting against many, many different factors. Parry was killed and he was 33 years old, and he was probably going to, to come nearer to this argument. And Lord hinted at this in many, many of his texts, as you can see in the one that I showed about formula and thing. But again, they were not developing it because it was a time where you needed to explain the difference between composition performance and written composition, right? And nothing else could matter because we were at war, right? So rather than saying that they would be against this completely, I would like to you know, give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they didn't have the time to develop their arguments further, especially because I see in the Lord many passages where he really seems to be taking me into account. But he didn't know how, perhaps. No, I mean, this whole school, pleasure and folly, and all this uh, uh, expertly conducted that you mentioned, that you mentioned, they follow that idea. And I think it's neglected, this uh, formulaic nature of language itself, in general neglected. So, if you're, and um, I was, uh, papers and works and presentations, for me, are great arguments just to, to make a balance between them. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, it is, of course, formulaic. But a great deal of it comes from the language itself. It's not that. Uh, okay, we have a thank you. We have another question here. It's just some thoughts. Um, uh, I tell them because uh, I was thinking about written and the spoken language. And, uh, just the starting point was how we present now those conferences, and uh, you just asked to <laughs> speak loud. Um, and also, second thing is how we do research. Also, we produce a lot of papers, or we analyze text, and just because I was analyzing pictures in uh, other quality research projects, it's more like uh, more um, modern, I say, to analyze pictures, uh, to write texts, to transcribe. But it's not uh, a, a new way, like analyzing oral, spoken. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, they're all. Uh, yeah, oral interaction. Interaction. We're doing it's, now. It's, 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 it's also flüchtig. It means that it, it's not. Um, uh, you can't not capture it in text. And it's text. fluid. Fluid or yeah, a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I think it has also something to do with that you can make it uh, visible. So you can't make it. So much visible, you hear it, you feel the pres presence of the person, and such things. Uh, that's, that's just now, I can't uh, explain it really uh, deeply, uh, but uh, it brought me then to this um, uh, topic of this can the sub of them speak from Jewish part? And so, uh, who can speak and uh, which uh, 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 the 
she made the standard, but in the Buddhism, the master has written um, tradition. tradition. Uh, they are um, history or so, could not be like, a, or they could not participate in society and speak in the way we can and um, get their needs on. And I think that's also really important to cons uh, consider and uh, how we deal with the, the uh, reactor, how we um, um, give the um, uh, value, how we value like return on spoken language and, and yeah, and then it's, it's really difficult uh, to come together with all this. But uh, uh, one thing I think the one is to the, the inequality, uh, how we value like written as a spoken language and uh, which is uh, which uh, actually goes into the discourse, uh, the entrances. So the all is like getting very less. And uh, I think, and uh, at least one point is how we can communicate like scientific knowledge. Because when we are lacking now all competence, competence to, to transmit the, the, uh, the scientific knowledge. So we lose somehow the gap gets bigger to, to people who are not so into the written language. And I think that's a really that's something that should be more uh, in uh, research. Yeah, the, I can, you know, I, I agree these are very interesting thoughts. I can summarize perhaps the, the, the problem. With the, the two major things, why, the two major challenges why we thought we would never get the Freiburg scholarship. And these people in Freiburg, they, they, they must be crazy. Right? So one thing is here you're opposing oral and written, of course, and, and that's very obvious. Uh, but oral and written, by oral and written, you're also opposing uh, mediated and non-mediated communication is a uh, very huge uh, thing. So th th uh, this doesn't mean they don't coexist. Uh, an oral singer may know how to read and write and still be an oral singer. It's just how does he compose? Does he compose in his traditional way or is, is he switched to, to writing lines? Because these are really different things because writing is a technology that we are not aware of as we will probably won't be aware of computers and, and, and cell phones, cell phones in a few years from now. But it's it's very recent. It's very recent. It's it's only ten percent of the of the species time and and even today half of the world population cannot really communicate fluently that way. So you need to take to into these things into account when you're addressing this challenge because you're also pointing at the fact that real communication is multimodal, it doesn't have a mean uh, language or rhythm, it has prosody, it has gesture. In, in this case, we also throw in music, so the complexity uh, is really daunting. That's one of the oppositions. And the other position, which was particularly interesting for me, was the poetics linguistics. Uh, I don't know, abyss separating them? Uh, the, this, this, I, I have never understood why in many universities they sit in different buildings or, or, or in different places. So the, the fact is that uh, if you want to learn about language, you have a very good model explaining the origins of language and explaining human cognition. You have to explain this. You have to explain oral composition and performance. If you don't explain it, then you're not good for, for an overall explanation of what is going on because this is all over the place. And at the same time, if 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 you want to really address the literary the literary or the poetic value of these things, you have to understand how the mystic tradition is developed from the basis of formulate stop form, uh, stop phrases and, and themes. So you really need to combine the two things, and, and this, the fellowship was in linguistics and poetics, so that's why we had a, a goal. It was, people were supposed to really collaborate, and, and I know how long the linguist, a hardcore linguist, to do this. Now, the fact that this is so exceptional is what I don't like, because I really think that 
people who are interested, especially people who have usage-based models of language and are interested in showing that uh, creativity combines with convention when, when we are communicating in, in language. They should really be interested in, in poetic phenomena such as this. Perhaps they might say that written poetry is too artificial, but there is no excuse for them looking at something like this. Like I keep looking at the construction grammar guy, but you know, I can't help it. So, yes, I would summarize that those were the two challenges, but uh, we were very lucky and, and we hope to continue to do some more work and we hope that more people join in. And uh, if I can do some advertising, there is a collective volume coming in in the Gruter uh, from the conference we had with Helmut Belgrade. And uh, we have uh, chapters by people such as Lydia, who did a great work on this. And uh, who knows what? So please join us in studying oral poetics. <laughs> And to join us for lunch. We have to send the lunch begin, and this is the first festival, and the new one begins at home.